Well, welcome everyone to Asylum at the Southern Border here at San Diego Log Library with our guest speaker, Margaret Cargioli. I will be introducing her in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to allow everyone to come in. I know it takes some time to find that link. I do see people streaming in to our virtual webinar now. So we'll just give everyone a couple minutes to get settled and I'll go over some housekeeping with everyone. So one thing for those of you who've attended before, you know that the chat has been disabled and if you have any questions for our speaker, you go ahead and use the Q&A feature to submit those and we will be taking questions at the end. There will also be a survey link that each of you will be taken to at the end of the webinar. And we really would appreciate if everyone would fill out those surveys because we really take your opinion seriously and we love serving our patrons in the way that we, best we can. So know that your opinion counts. Please fill that out. And it looks like we have quite a few more people coming. So I'll just give it a little bit longer. Oh, hi, Mary. Nice to see you virtually. <laughs> this is one of our webinars as part of our MCLE crunch time that we always do in December and January. So it's always nice to see familiar faces coming to these classes. Oh, looks like we still have a few more people coming in. So I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm a reference librarian at San Diego Law Library and with me is my counterpart, Cheryl Weeks Spry. She will also be a reference librarian at San Diego Law Library and she is helping me on the technological side. So thank you for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker, Ms. Margaret Cargioli. She is a managing attorney of the Cross Border Initiative Program at the Immigrant Defenders Law Center based in San Diego. She leads the CBI team in providing deportation defense to families on both sides of the border. Throughout her legal career, Margaret has worked on behalf of the underserved indigent groups, including victims of domestic violence and asylum seekers. So with no further ado, Margaret, could you take it away? Thank you everyone for um, joining me today to talk about uh, the important topic of asylum at the US Southern border. Um, I am uh, proudly working at Immigrant Defenders Law Center, where we um, help asylum seekers um, try to access U.S. asylum in the United States. Um, so I'll be going over um, a little bit of history, uh, recent history about um, what's been happening at the U.S. southern border, um, just to put a little bit of context and understanding uh, why you're hearing in the media about so many people trying to access the United States for asylum. I'm going to talk about two um, main policies um, right now that are in place, Title 42 and the Migrant Protection Protocols Program that um, was recently restarted under the Biden administration. So with regard to some important recent um, policies that uh, have been in place in the last few years, I just want to remind everyone of some of the sweeping changes that the Trump administration made um, with regard to trying to seek asylum in the United States. Um, so one policy that had a huge impact on uh, the ability to access asylum was is metering. Um, it was actually implemented by uh, Barack Obama, um, but it was really expanded and used more extensively um, by uh, the Trump administration. And essentially what metering is uh, re with regard to both administrations, it was when people were approaching the ports of entry to ask for asylum, they were being told by Customs and Border uh, Protection officials that um, there's no space at the facility right now, that they should just put their name on a list, like a wait list. And um, there are about 16,000 people um, that, are, that were placed on a list, um, which stopped being implemented at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and a recent uh, federal court ruling uh, found metering to be unlawful. It's the Al Otro Lado uh, versus Wolf case. Um, and right now, I believe we're still in the stages of waiting um, to see what remedies um, may be issued in that case. Another uh, recent uh, border policy um, that was in place in the prior administration is the asylum cooperative agreements. 
And those are agreements with the countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, uh, where essentially um, under the Trump administration, um, the notion was to try to expeditiously return people that were coming to the U.S. southern border to those countries without giving them meaningful access to counsel um, at border patrol stations, for instance. And at least 158 uh, Salvadorans and Hondurans um, were sent to Guatemala, for example, under the ACA. Biden uh, did end that through the exec through executive order. With regard to, um, sorry, give me one second. I just want to move to read the slide. Um, with regard to one of the most um, impactful policies that have, that have been in place since the, the beginning of the pandemic um, is uh, Title 42. So when the pandemic um, hit, uh, you know, its highest peak in March uh, of 2020, the, um, sorry, 2019, the uh, Trump administration uh, used the, the pandemic as a, a reason for which not to be able to process asylum seekers at the U.S. southern border. And as of that time period, basically, it's essentially as if the, the U.S. southern border is closed to anyone that wants to seek asylum. Persons who are, um, which I'll explain a little bit further, are either sent back to their country of origin or just sent back to uh, Mexico uh, and not given any access to the U.S. asylum system. They're not ordered removed, which is an important distinction that should be noted, but they're just expelled expeditiously um, to either the country of origin or to Mexico. Um, there's been litigation as to Title 42. Um, in September of 2021, uh, federal court stayed um, Title 42 with regard to families. That's the We Should, we should Be Mayorkas case. Um, and the judge in that case, um, ruled basically that it's unlawful, uh, it's an unlawful policy. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the policy still remains in effect because the government um, chose to continue fighting the case. So there are very few exemptions to Title 42. Um, as I had described earlier, these are actually asylum seekers that are approaching the U.S. southern border asking for asylum or entering in between ports of entry into the United States, being apprehended by officials. Um, and instead of being processed for asylum like they would have been under um, prior to Title 42, uh, they are actually um, subjected to expeditious removal. If there are um, extenuating circumstances. It's possible to try to get someone not subjected to Title 42 and help them enter the United States to seek asylum. So one thing that an attorney can do uh, in that circumstance would be to file a humanitarian parole request with Customs and Border Protection. And uh, that could be under IN, INA 212D5 where a non-citizen can be paroled into the United States for an urgent humanitarian reason. So attorneys um, have been filing humanitarian parole requests, for example, for families that are at the US southern border, maybe a family from Honduras, for example, who has a child that has epilepsy. And the attorney can uh, show you know, medical evidence that this child is is not well and needs medication, and that the family has fled um, their country of origin in need of asylum in the United States. Once that's presented to Customs and Border Protection, um, they have full discretion to um, adjudicate and grant it and allow that family to enter the United States. Unfortunately, we've seen very inconsistencies along the US southern border as to which humanitarian parole cases will be granted or denied. In some ports of entry, um, like El Paso, for instance, we've seen um, some exemption requests um, granted more frequently than in other parts of the border. Uh, in San Isidro and San Diego, um, we've seen very, very few cases of the one that I just explained uh, granted. Another way to 
um, try to help asylum seekers who want to enter the United States uh, be admitted is um, to file a Title 42 exemption request. And that also would be filed with Customs and Border Protection. And it is with regard to um, an exception to Title 42, which are for persons of law enforcement, public safety, humanitarian, or public health concern. They should not be subjected to Title 42. Um, there's not clear guidance by the government exactly what qualifies as a humanitarian exception. Uh, we don't have you know, information that delineates um, what could or could not um, be considered. However, we've seen that those types of requests have been granted at some ports of entry uh, and in the same realm of humanitarian parole under 212b5 where there are maybe um, family members with serious health issues per se. Um, with regard to humanitarian parole, I also just want to reiterate uh, that you can raise uh, safety concerns, uh, because unfortunately, there are very serious safety issues for migrants and asylum seekers fleeing certain countries that are in Mexico awaiting to enter the United States. And thirdly, another way to um, try to help an asylum seeker enter the United States and avoid being subjected to Title 42 would be for the individual that presents at either port of entry or is detained after entering without inspection in between ports of entry, if that individual affirmatively tells Customs and Border Protection that they're afraid that they'll be tortured in their country of origin, uh, they should be uh, allowed to undergo a screening for relief under the Convention Against Torture. If they pass that screening, they will then be allowed to enter the United States to seek asylum under Title VIII. Uh, the statistics on this, unfortunately, are not great, and there have been very few individuals who have even been screened for relief under the Convention Against Torture. Uh, and the, within that group, there have been about approximately only like 350 as of March uh, of this year that have passed the screening. It is a very, very high standard, uh, which is quite concerning given um, the types of harm that people are fleeing. One other thing that I want to know um, and to make clear with regard to these exemptions is that it puts a lot really high burden on the individual that's um, fleeing harm. As I mentioned, with, for relief as a condition against torture, the individual has to affirmatively inform the Customs and Border Protection official. And with regard to humanitarian parole and Title 42 exemption requests, um, this is not something that um, someone without an attorney would know. Uh, how to do or necessarily know how to prepare an application, and even for the request that attorneys have been making over the past uh, few months, we uh, don't have much guidance from the government and tend to sometimes wait months for a decision. As to um, the Convention Against Torture screening that I mentioned, um, the individual undergoes the screening, and this is an example of a notice that has been given to some persons that have undergone that screening, and it just basically says whether they've passed it or not. We have not seen this given out to many, many of the people that have been returned to um, Mexico or their country of origin under Title 42. Uh, it's been given to just a few individuals from, from what I'm aware. Um, so as I was mentioning uh, with humanitarian parole, uh, it's, it's quite difficult for an individual to prepare on their own. Uh, another important thing to understand is that the decision cannot be appealed, uh, uh, which is of, of concern. You can uh, resubmit a request after it's denied if you have obtained further evidence or stronger evidence of a particular issue. Um, one example of that could be is um, I submitted a, an application for someone who had like breast pain and um, didn't really have access to, to get further testing to confirm what the health issue is or not. It was denied by CBP, Customs and Border Protection, and now um, through the health proven organization in, um, at the border, this person is going to undergo testing, um, and if in the unfortunate event that it does confirm there's something very serious happening, I will resubmit the, the uh, humanitarian parole request. 
So um, there's no limit as to the times that you can attempt to resubmit a, an a application or request. Um, and as I mentioned, they've been um, granted in very low numbers of late. One um, important thing to clarify when speaking with persons that are trying to enter the United States, uh, there's been some confusion on the ground because of all the recent changes in border policies. And in March of 2020, the US government um, had restricted non-essential travel um, at ports of entry, as I had mentioned during the pandemic. And then in November of 2021, the US government made a change to Title 19 to allow certain travelers with visas who are fully vaccinated to enter through the US southern border. And this recent change in November 2021 caused some confusion for asylum seekers because they heard an announcement of that certain people does not apply to asylum seekers. With regard to uh, another policy that is going to have a huge impact um, in the coming weeks here in, uh, in San Diego is the Migrant Protection Protocols Program. So just a little bit of history with regard to that is that in January of 2019, uh, Trump implemented MPP, what we will call now 1.0, uh, and it applied to certain persons entering uh, or attempting to enter the United States from any Mexican border city or town and they would be uh, given their notice to appear. They would be issued uh, paperwork explaining that they've been in processed into the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, and they would be returned to Mexico to await the adjudication of their U.S. immigration court hearing. It applied to all Spanish-speaking countries, and at the very, very um, right prior to the pandemic. Uh, they added Brazil uh, as one of the countries subjected to MPP. Uh, the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, also known as Remain in Mexico, has never applied to Mexican, Mexican citizens. Title 42 does apply um, to Mexican uh, citizens, and they're not able to um, seek asylum in the United States at this time, except for if they meet one of the exceptions that I mentioned prior. Uh, with regard to MPP, once the Biden administration um, began in January 2021, they halted new enrollment into the Migrant Protection, Protection Protocols Program. Up until that point, there were approximately 70,000 persons that had been enrolled in MPP. And the Biden administration, uh, from the outset, uh, had um, spoken about how um, dangerous, inhumane, the Migrant Protection Protocols Program is. Um, the Joe Biden had once called the Remain in Mexico policy, quote, dangerous, inhumane, and said it goes against everything we stand for as a nation of immigrants. And um, they issued a memo, the Biden administration issued a memo um, ending enrollment in 10 PP. And they created a wind down process for the persons that had been placed into MPP and were still in Mexico, or some had returned to their country of origin because unfortunately they were in precarious circumstances in Mexico. And this wind down process began in February of 2021. And it was to process, the first phase of it was to process any persons with active MPP cases. Those were considered cases um, where people were awaiting an upcoming hearing at, at um, immigration court or had a pending appeal before the BIA. And these persons um, were helped with, uh, were helped uh, by UNHCR uh, to be processed into the United States in order to continue their immigration court hearings. The next phase of the wind down was announced a few months later, and that was to apply to people whose cases had been terminated by an immigration judge or who had received an order, an in absentia order of removal. Those persons were also going to start be, begin to be allowed into the United States to continue seeking asylum in the United States. However, at that time, right when it was about, right when it started a few weeks in, 
um, there was a ruling in a Texas federal court, a federal court in Texas, um, whereby the um, court said that uh, MPP had to restart. And unfortunately, because of the injunction, um, the Biden administration uh, took the position that um, it had to, to restart the program and started um, talks with the Mexican government with regard to starting restarting MPP, which we'll call MPP 2.0. Uh, the Biden administration issued a new termination memo on October 29th, 2021. And um, regardless of the new termination memo, uh, MPP 2.0 has started. Um, the government announced in December 2021 that, that it will restart, that it will be slowly, gradually restarting along the US southern border. And on December 6, it started in El Paso. Uh, in El Paso, uh, the persons that were first placed into MPP 2.0 have been um, all single adults as of Yesterday, I have not heard of any families being placed um, into MPP and returned to Mexico. Uh, we've seen um, several on different nationalities that have been placed into MPP, including persons from Colombia, um, Central America. And there have been changes, unfortunately, as to the migrant protection protocols for Made in Mexico program. It's been expanded, unfortunately. Uh, regardless of uh, President Biden having spoken about how it's inhumane, uh, the administration has chosen uh, to spend it in ways that are of concern. Uh, it will include persons of uh, other nationalities. So um, the places where MPP 2.0 will take place are San Diego, Calexico, Nogales, El Paso, Eagle Pass, Laredo, and, Browns and Brownsville. Um, they, the government has said that um, only persons who enter without inspection will actually be placed into MPP. Um, this, I think the, the uh, guidelines that the government issued in naming uh, these places of where MPP will take place, I think caused some confusion when, when the guidelines were first issued and it uh, seemingly uh, appeared that persons that presented themselves at these ports of entry would be processed into the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, but the government has stated that it will not apply to persons that present themselves at POE. It's for persons that enter in between ports of entry without inspection. Uh, and so it's very important to let individuals know that uh, presenting themselves at a port of entry will not afford them being processed into um, MPP, uh, allowing them to start an asylum case. Uh, because remember, Title 42 is still in place and persons could be subjecting themselves to being um, expeditiously returned to Mexico or to their country of origin. And if there, there's fear of harm there, you know, it's, it's, uh, of, it's of concern. It is Customs and Border Protection that will enroll uh, certain people who are detected within 96 hours of entering, within a, uh, entering the United States. Um, I've asked the, the government for clarification as to how these 96 hours will be proven, how these 96 hours could be contested, and we, we haven't received much clarification. Um, however, I think that's something very important for uh, attorneys to keep in mind with regard to um, any individuals that rep they represent uh, as to the MPP program. Uh, if, if you speak with the individual that's been placed into the program and they um, can assure you or give you proof that you know, they, they were not detected within the 96 hours, that, that's possibly challengeable and something to, to keep in mind. There are certain individuals that the United States government said will not be subjected to MPP, and those include um, unaccompanied children, uh, permanent residents of the US, non-citizens with advanced parole or in parole status, um, non-citizens with criminal history, 
non-citizens of law enforcement interest to the U.S. or Mexican or to the Mexican government. Uh, people with certain vulnerabilities, such as uh, persons with known medical um, or mental health uh, conditions, people with certain difficulties given their advanced age. And the government has also said that people with increased risk of harm in Mexico due to sexual orientation or gender identity should also uh, not be placed into um, MPP. One thing that is you know, of concern here is that we saw with regard to MPP 1.0 that persons with medical conditions were actually placed by Customs and Border Protection into the MPP program. Um, so uh, attorneys and, and, and advocates and individuals working in this realm um, should really be mindful of, you know, screening and making sure that um, just because someone has been placed in MPP and the government has said that they're not going to place those individuals in the program, uh, do not assume that the person that is seeking your guidance or representation maybe does have a mental health condition that they were not adequately screened for. Uh, or that maybe one of their children has a medical condition that um, was not properly screened for. And it's just really important to reiterate this because we saw with MPP 1.0 that unfortunately many, many people with, um, with serious health conditions were placed into the program. Another, um, means for which persons who should not be subjected to being forced to stay in Mexico can try to uh, be removed from the migrant protection protocols program is uh, a non-refoulement interview. Um, really, uh, just to clarify, um, as the President Biden has said, the Remain in Mexico policy is dangerous and humane overall. Um, however, Unfortunately, with it being in place, um, I, this will be a way to try to help maybe the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And essentially, it gives an individual a right to request an interview with USCIS if they fear safety or harm in Mexico. And the interview will take place at um, Border Patrol Station. And theoretically, uh, individuals can present, um, well, actually, first, when they're placed into the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, Customs and Border Protection are supposed to affirmatively ask individuals if they fear a return to Mexico. And if they confirmed as such, then that individual will uh, be given a right to have what's called a non-refoulement interview uh, with a USCIS asylum officer. The asylum officer will be present by phone and the individuals will have 24 hours to consult with a legal representative prior to the fear interview. Um, they can waive that, um, that time period and they can actually ask for, for more time and if within reason, as the guidance says, um, if it's a reasonable period of time, they can be given that time. One thing to keep in mind with regard to MPP 1.0 is that in California, the ACLU had filed a, a loss in the federal court uh, whereby they obtained a preliminary injunction uh, stating that individuals who are subject to non minor non reform interview in California can have an attorney present at their interview. Um, as far as I understand, a few months ago, the ACLU has asked that um, that matter be reinstated. Uh, and I think they're awaiting um, it, the, the hearings, the case is still going forward in federal court, uh, basically, but there is that preliminary injunction. It only applied to California, it did not apply to other parts of the border. And as for the guidance, it does say that an, that an attorney can be present. Um, and uh, we've heard at meetings that the attorney can be present by telephone. Um, so, but it's very, very important to keep in mind um, the Dovey, uh, when it was Dovey Wolf at the time it was filed, the Dovey Mayorkas now, 
uh, to keep that case in mind uh, to ask to be present for the non refoulement interview. The, uh, the type of information that the US government um, will be providing individuals um, that are to be placed into MPP are supposedly going to be like a, a legal resource packet. Um, they're supposed to have the right to, um, the right to um, telephonic or virtual means of communications with US attorneys in a confidential setting and translation services if necessary. Uh, one thing that uh, the government has confirmed in a meeting is that um, as of now, uh, as of a few days ago, uh, we were told that there is only material legal resource packets available in Spanish. And so persons that um, do not have legal resource packets available in their language will not be placed into MPP. Um, and as I've said thus far, we've seen single adults only placed in MPP. They've all been of Spanish speaking countries as far as I am aware, um, even though um, MPP 2.0 now includes anyone from the Western hemisphere, for example, Haitians. I have not heard of any Haitians as yet being placed into MPP. Um, another thing that um, individuals uh, supposedly will have access to is this, like these telephonic and virtual means of communication. Um, although uh, with speaking to shelters on the ground in Tijuana, it, it's not very clear um, exactly, you know, where these um, access to uh, communication will be will be set up or provided. It seems some some access will be given possibly um, through shel um, through laptops that some shelters have been given in, in Tijuana, for example, to try to connect people with US attorney. Um, uh, with regard to um, the non Mont interview in particular, um, the, the standard that was in place with MPP 1.0 has been lowered uh, as to MPP 2.0. Um, so the standard was much higher when, with MPP 1.1. And unfortunately, the vast majority of persons that were placed in MPP 1 and had asked for non refoulement interview did not pass the interview. Uh, now it is a reasonable possibility of persecution standard, and it has to be due to one of the protected grounds. So it has to be either based on race, the fear of return to Mexico has to either be uh, with regard to race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, um, or that they may be subjected to torture in Mexico. Um, Attorneys working with individuals on this obviously is very important, um, you know, to, to reiterate the, the protected ground. And unfortunately, uh, we know based on MPP 1.0 that if thousands, you know, thousands of persons place in this program, it will be very hard for them to actually access attorneys at, and imagine not having an attorney and having to understand explaining your fear and making sure that you um, bring forth the, the most important facts that really um, highlight and note the, the protected ground. So this is something that's of concern to advocates with regard to MPP 2.0. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with regard to non a interview, it's at the outset when Customs and Border Protection will be placing someone or looking to place someone in MPP. They will ask that person if they're afraid. And um, if the person says yes, they, they should have the interview. However, we know based on MPP 1 that uh, when persons return to Mexico, they are sometimes waiting weeks, months for their hearings to go forward in US immigration court, that they are subjected to the very, very serious crimes that are targeted. Uh, they're targeted because they're migrants, they're targeted because of their nationality or their race. Uh, they're, you know, there have been um, well-documented accounts by a Human Rights First of the thousands of persons that were harmed in Mexico um, that have been subjected to MPP. 
And so individuals that possibly did not pass a, a fear interview at the outset when they were placed in temp PP and return and unfortunately are subjected to harm or threats or danger can go back to the port of entry and ask for a non refoulement interview. They could also ask for it at a court hearing. They can ask for it from the Department of Homeland Security who's supposed to then uh, make sure that when the person is sent back after their court hearing and processed at the POE that they uh, are given access to USCIS for uh, a fear interview. It is not the judge who will schedule the interview. It's the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the trial attorney will do it. However, I think that it's important that um, that this be raised on the record uh, to make sure that um, that these requests are noted, that there's some kind of documentation um, proof, and, and also just um, to ensure that, that DHS follows through on, on the request. One area of, of concern with regard to MPP-1 was um, that the majority of the 70,000 people that had been placed into the Remain in Mexico program could not find attorneys that were willing to take their case. And um, that's something that will be of concern with regard to MPP-2. Uh, CBP has said, the government has said that CBP will provide information from the Department of, of the Department of State on where to find safe and confidential spaces in Mexico to contact the U.S. attorney by phone or video, um, and that the MPP respondents should have access to telephones and, when possible, video connection uh, for free calls while in DHS custody, including the 24-hour period prior to their non refoulement interview. Uh, however, in reality, we're, we're speaking of, um, you know, very, very limited resources that these people will, will have um, at hand. Uh, we know that um, with regard to MPP-1, there were not many attorneys that were willing to take a case for someone that is residing at a dangerous Border, dangerous border city like Tijuana or Mexicali. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a huge concern uh, with regard to MPP. And uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, the Biden, Joe Biden, I believe, had said that MPP goes, quote unquote, goes against everything we stand for as a nation of immigrants. Uh, in court, uh, with regard to the guidance, it says that MPP respondents will be able to meet with counsel in a confidential setting prior to the start of their hearings. Uh, this was something that um, was not available, uh, readily available, or, or, or done well with regard to MPP-1. Uh, and we're talking about persons that will be traveling from different parts of the port of entry to try to get to their court hearings. and um, Many of them have to travel for hours, have to present hours ahead. And even though there's possibly a confidential setting provided, uh, it, it just does not um, equate to being able to meet with your client in your office uh, and having that private confidential space where, where you can have that rapport. Um, counsel can be present either in person or by video with regard to MPP court hearings. Uh, we called the court yesterday uh, in San Diego actually just to inquire whether MPP court hearings will um, allow persons uh, to, you know, will allow the public to um, listen in on hearings. And uh, for now, it's, it's not clear um, if they will allow everyone in for the hearings with regard to either, either WebEx or by phone. The MPP guidance that, that was issued by the government that we've shared in the material um, also addresses access to interpretation. And as I mentioned earlier, all persons uh, should receive MPP material in their primary language. However, at this time, it is not available. Um, as far as I know, as of yesterday, it's not available in any other language except Spanish. Uh, of course, um, if the do documentation is not available, uh, this is a huge concern. And even though CBP said they will use an interpreter to explain the process, we all know that um, for certain languages, it is, it, it is 
very difficult to try to get access to an interpreter by phone, even using the best service interpreter service provider that you can think of. Um, it's, it's a concern that we know that there'll be persons that will be at a border patrol station, CBP may be trying to get access to an interpreter and is not um, able to, to get that interpreter. So we, as attorneys, we should monitor and I think ask persons that were placed in TEMPP um, or we're not, we're not even placed in TEMPP. Maybe we, we encounter someone in the US that actually um, was allowed to come under Title VIII, but talk to us about maybe being held at a border patrol station for a prolonged period of time that, you know, border CBP was trying to get an interpreter. How long were they held? Were they held overnight? Were they held a few days? It's something that I think um, we need to monitor and see what happens in, in that area. Uh, of course, we're, we're concerned about, you know, indigenous language speakers um, because it is hard um, from experience in immigration court even to sometimes get access to interpreters readily available on the phone. Um, and so I, I raised with, in a meeting with the government as to why um, indigenous language speakers have to be subjected to the MPP. Um, and there was no response except that um, they will be um, translated, uh, they will be having uh, all the MPP material um, made available. In, in all languages. Some other um, things to keep in mind with regard to MPP is that um, there have been uh, federal lawsuits pending for several years now uh, as to um, several aspects of uh, the program. The um, most recent uh, ruling that we've heard of um, just on the 13th of December was the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit has upheld um, the federal court ruling on the restart of MPP. Um, unfortunately, as I said, you know, after the Biden administration had issued memos calling um, to not have to not continue MPP, uh, the, the a few states brought a lawsuit against the Biden administration, uh, basically alleging that. Because MPP had ended, they're, they're, um, those states are dealing with um, a lot of undocumented persons that are not being sent to detention centers, and it's um, uh, putting ex uh, extrapolating resources from those states. And um, there was an unfortunate uh, ruling on the lower court, and now that it, it's been upheld by the Court of Appeals. Um, the government, the Biden administration, is uh, fighting that case. And at the same time, there were um, federal lawsuits prior challenging the legality and other aspects of uh, MPP. And those cases are still continuing. So there's the Innovation Law Lab versus, versus Mayorkas case, which um, has oh, was sent to the Supreme Court and then was, has recently been remanded. Um, there was a good uh, decision at the outset of the Ninth Circuit in that case, at the very beginning of MPP-1, um, finding that, um, there, that MPP was unlawful. Uh, unfortunately, we're still waiting to see what will happen with that case. Um, we're not sure if um, that case will continue to be adjudicated or possibly be settled. Uh, we have not heard from the Biden administration as to whether in that lawsuit they will um, agree that uh, MPP is unlawful. And there's another case that I'd like to mention. These are this is not an exhaustive list, of course, but there's the Immigrant Defenders Law Center v. Mayorkas case, um, which mainly um, is as to the problems with MPP-1 uh, and the lack of access to counsel. Um, that also is pending, um, and we'll see what happens with that case. I did share in the material um, some MPP documents that um, have been given out to persons that were placed in, in the MPP in El Paso. Um, so you can take a look at that later, but uh, before being returned uh, to Mexico to wait for their court hearing, individuals should be given their notice to appear. Uh, information about their next appointment, uh, including the date, time, and location, the legal resource packet, which we've mentioned, 
And if they did um, express a fear of uh, being returned to Mexico and were given a non refoulement interview, they should be given a decision as to the outcome of that interview. Um, and uh, as I said, have access to those resources um, in the email that was sent prior to the presentation. Um, there, so I do want to talk about some of the unknowns um, at this time, just to you know explain. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, and if, uh, I'll anticipate some here. Um, but a lot of it will will actually come to know once it's in place, once MPP is in place. In, in various regions. Um, there's there have only been a few people who've been placed in MPP, as I said, only single adults. We don't know right now if families will begin to be placed in MPP. Uh, what will happen to those families um, with regard to uh, where they'd have to stay um, if returned to Mexico. The government has said, for example, um, that they will ensure that, um, you know, the house, like safe housing um, and access to resources. However, um, based on what we saw with MPP-1, there, there are very serious um, safety concerns in many of the border towns and cities where people have to wait for their hearings. And there are just an extreme lack of resources. I'm sure many of you will remember the encampments in Matamoros. Um, right now, uh, as having heard from several shelters in Tijuana, they are all at capacity. Uh, and so that's just something that um, is really more of an unknown right now. Another thing that um, the government has said is that it will um, assist with, that, that they, will, they will assist with transportation to get into ports of entry. Um, INM uh, will assist with transporting persons to and from the port of entry for their court hearings. That um, is all we know right now. I understand also that INM may be transporting persons a bit further away from uh, the port of entry into other shelters, possibly. Another thing that's not clear at this time also is at what time the court hearings will take place um, in each and every uh, court where that will be hearing MPP um, cases. Something that was of extreme concern with MPP-1 is that people would have hearing, you'd have a hearing at eight, you'd have to be at the POE at the port of entry four hours before. Um, so like four in the morning, you know, people would be lining up, uh, basically exposing themselves to cartels and kidnapping and assaults and uh, robbery, et cetera, because um, the various groups would know that, oh, you know, MPP respondents, all these, these migrants, they, they have their hearing at, we know that every day they're gonna be there at four, we know when they come back from court, we know when to look for them, basically. Um, and that is still of, of extreme concern. Um, another thing just to, to keep in mind with all the policies that are in place right now um, is that anyone that enters in between ports of entry and is apprehended, they will either be placed, they can either be placed into MPP or they can be removed under Title 42. Uh, at the same time, we also have expedited removal that's in place. So um, the government has explained that they will first assess whether an individual, whether an individual or family um, is subject to Title 42. That seems to be the priority because the government is using deterrence as, as their method um, at the border. And so that family or individual can be, like I said, under Title 42 expelled immediately to Mexico or to their country of origin. Uh, they, the government will then look to see if the person could be placed into MPP or expedited removal. That's the way that the government has explained. I had specifically asked at a meeting if it would be MPP and or uh, if they would look to use expedited removal against an individual and then if they fail, um, the, the credible fear interview then placed into MPP and it was explained to me that no, it would be either or MPP or expedited removal. Uh, we cannot forget the 
tens of thousands of persons that were in MPP1. Uh, as, as I mentioned at the outset of the um, presentation, there were many individuals who had cases pending, active cases. The majority, of, the majority, not all of those persons were processed under the wind down. Some with complicated cases are still in Mexico. I have a client who actually has an active um, case, but her sister and her nephew joined the family after, and it's called a mixed family. And so that family um, was never able to be processed under the wind down, even though they have an active on PP1 case. Um, and there are all those persons that had terminated cases and uh, in absentia orders of removal who are still in Mexico or in country of origin and the, government, the Biden administration has not said what will happen to them. Um, and just to be clear, a lot of those cases were terminated because um, individuals, MPP respondents had, um, had been charged as um, arriving aliens, even though they had actually entered without inspection, been apprehended and then placed into the MPP program. So many judges um, uh, terminated cases based on um, faulty NTAs as to that. A lot of people in MPP-1 unfortunately were kidnapped and could not attend their hearing because of the day of their kidnapping, they obviously could not make it to court. I, I, um, filed a motion to reopen in such a case um, where we explained to the court um, that uh, um, a couple and their daughter and young child had, had been kidnapped um, and held for months and could not make it to their hearing. Luckily, in that case, um, the motion to reopen was granted. Um, however, many people in those circumstances right now are still in Mexico or were forced possibly to return to their country of origin. And, um, they don't know what will happen to their MPP cases. Um, there's just some references um, and the handout that I had given, the guidance and statistics on Title 42, which I encourage everyone to look at. Um, this is an unprecedented time um, in the history of the US where we're seeing um, thousands of people not welcome into the United States to seek asylum. And it's, it's extremely concerning. And then now I just have a few minutes if anyone has any questions with regard to MPP or Title 42. Hi, Margaret. Thank you so much for such a, a fantastic presentation for us here at the Law Library. I know I enjoyed it. I just had a question for you, actually, if you don't mind sharing. Uh, what drew you to this profession? When did you know you wanted to practice this area of law? Yeah, so I actually have, um, I studied international relations and political science in undergrad and graduate school. And in graduate school, I took a refugee law course and I found it extremely interesting. It, um, and I actually loved it. And as of, you know, that, day, at that time when I took um, that refugee law course in graduate school, I knew I wanted to go to law school to um, do asylum work. It's fantastic. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today. And as a reminder, please fill out the survey that you all be sent and we look forward to seeing you all at our next class. Thank you so much, Margaret. Hope everyone has a great day. And Cheryl, you can go ahead and end the webinar.